Okay. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's Fred Plotkin on Fridays. That makes me Fred Plotkin. And I've been doing this now for a little more than a year, every Friday. And I have as my guests always people who inspire me, who do great and interesting things. In some cases, there are people I know personally. In the case of today's guest, it's someone I've known through her work for quite a while, but I've never met. I'm thrilled. That's the word. I'm honored and thrilled to have Michelle Martin join me today. Michelle Martin, in my view, is the foremost exponent I know of the art of the journalistic interview. I have been listening to her for years. And I use the word listen very advisedly because, number one, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you for um, having me. <laughs> sure. Um, I, in researching for today's conversation, discovered that Michelle Martin has had a very long career in print journalism, which at the time were things, there were papers I didn't read, the Washington Post and the, and the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. now I do. And then she went to ABC News at a time when I didn't have a television. In <laughs> fact, only in the past year have I had a television because I worked in opera houses for so long that there was no need to have TV. I didn't want TV, but I'm an avid listener. And now off, often I appear on what we call public radio in the United States. And I happened to tune in in 2007 to a program called Tell Me More. And I had no idea who Michelle Martin was. I, did, I knew nothing about her at all, frankly. But what struck me was the incisive questioning, the ability to get more information in a way that was always direct, but always caring and thoughtful and courteous. And I found that you were able to get a lot more interesting information that was something we could really use than most journalists who tend to have a different style or interviewers, I'll say as well which tends to be a little more driving, a little more interrupting than you do. And so often a person speaking would begin to get into a thread and then the journalist would interrupt that person. And I have tried, I don't model myself on anyone, but when I hold up the person, I think it's the gold standard of this kind of work, it happens to be you. So that's my introduction. Oh, well, Fred, that's very <laughs> kind of you. You flatter me. <laughs> Michelle Martin is now uh, the host on weekends of a program we have in the United States uh, called All Things Considered Weekend. It's a hugely popular show. It's an institution. And you also, because now in the past year, I'm living with someone who has a television, um, I see you often on Christian Amanpour's program on public broadcasting, where you, along with Walter Isaacson and Walter Isaacson and Hari Srinivasan, are a team of really first-rate interviewers and journalists. So my first question for you uh, is, to what degree does your print background in journalism, your being a reporter, inform the way you do broadcast journalism? Well, Fred, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for that extremely generous um, introduction. I'm embarrassed now, but, <laughs> um, but it, very much, it, it very much influences my work because I think that I am very interested in what is true. And unfortunately, I think, you know, we are in a world and in a moment where the, the the driving motivation for some of the people in our field isn't what's true, it's what they think. I'm also motivated by what I can find out as opposed to what I want to say. You know, this is something that I'm, I'm trying to hopefully inculcate into the next generation of journalists that I have the opportunity to influence, which is that, to, you know, tell me why you're in this business. Are you in this business for what you can learn? Or are you in this business for what you, you want to say yourself and you're just going to find somebody else to say it? And I, I don't want to sort of say that that's a generational problem because, you know, unfortunately I have, you know, I've been in this business a while and I've, I've you know, encountered lots of situations and it's not a, it's strictly a generational problem, but I do think that a lot of 
sort of we're in a moment where a lot of the next generation is very empowered and feels really strongly about, um, you know, uh, advancing certain ideas and arguments. And I just want to be very clear that, it, it, you know, there's like there are different aspects of this business and some people are in this business to tell you what they think. But I still want to hold up the side of the business that's in it to tell people what they can find out and what they want to learn and what they know as opposed to what they what they happen to think. And so already think without the benefit of reporting. And and um, that's that's where I am. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's a secret that uh, the media in America is very polarized, you know, right now that's by intention. There, there are certain news outlets that, 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 you know, organize themselves with the intention of pushing an ideological point of view, whatever they call it. We know that that's what it is. And other organizations have kind of risen up in response to that. I just feel like it's really important to point out that we have to have to be civic, to be, truly able to function as citizens, we have to have a commitment to the facts. And so, yeah, that, that informs me greatly. I, I'm really motivated by what, what can I learn from you? What, do, what can you tell me? I, I am very suspicious of people who go into an interview with the point of view of, you know, I know what's true, just come in here and agree with me. I'm reading from notes. I tend not to read from notes, uh -huh. but in this case, I really want to say it as I believe it. I wrote, I believe you know what you want to ask, but more than anyone I can think of, you don't stick to a script. You hear and listen and follow up based on what you have heard. Oh, very much so. And that's mm -hmm. becoming increasingly rare, I believe. Well, I, that I don't know as much because one of the funny things that happens when, you, when you've been in this business a while is that you, you no longer really know what other people's process is, you know, right? When you're, when you're just starting out and you can kind of tag along with other people and you kind of see how they do their job, but then the, the more experience you get kind of you tend, and right now we're all working by ourselves, right? Like who, who tags along with anybody? But it does seem to me that people aren't listening to each other. And I feel like that's, that seems to be like a societal problem, not necessarily just a journalistic problem. <laughs> I think it's a societal problem where conversation becomes like, when can I talk next? As opposed to, you said something, let me hear you. And then let me, let me see where that goes. And um, so to the degree to which, you know, I can, show people that I actually really am listening. I, I hope I'm doing that. In fact, I, I can think of, a, of an example. Uh, there was a, he's unfortunately, he's no longer alive. He's, a, he's an African-American minister, very conservative, who was very instrumental in uh, opposing same-sex marriage even in, in another part of the country he doesn't even live in. I mean, he's, he was based in Maryland, but he was a, a, a sort of a key player in fighting the, uh, or advancing an initiative to outlaw same-sex marriage in California. And uh, obviously, of course, all this has been sort of overturned. So this is very much in the rear view mirror, but I would have him on the program while he was involved with this to say, ask him like, why are you doing this? Like, why, what does this mean to you? Why uh, is this important to you? And I've obviously, you know, got a lot of criticism for it because some people found his comments offensive, which, you know, to certainly to some people they are. But one of the things he said to me that meant a lot to me, which he says, you know, I go on the conservative media and they want to celebrate me. I go on the progressive media and they want to vilify me. But the reason I come here is that you want to listen to me. And that is that is truly how I how I approach it, because and it's true. It was true because I just feel like the notion that, you know, we've decided who's right and who's wrong and who's a good person and who's terrible. Um, and we're just gonna, you know, invite you to agree with us. That's just not what I think I'm here to do. Now, I will say on the other side of it, unfortunately, increasingly, some of our guests, particularly on, you know, I'll just say it, one sort of the political side of the ledger have decided to sort of make us the problem, right? And they don't really come to our conversations with the intention of having a conversation. 
I'm sure you've heard that expression, own the libs, because, you know, I've had this happen to me when people come on the show, you try to have a conversation with them. They don't answer any of your questions. They don't really have a conversation with you. They just keep firing their talking points at you. And then when you decline to agree with them or you get into a, a, a confrontation with them, they then take to social media to talk about how hey, they own the libs. So you're not really having a conversation with them. And, you know, as much as we try to avoid that, sometimes you, you can't just out of the sort of spirit of fairness. But I think it's a real problem when you've got people who don't enter a conversation with the intention of having a good faith conversation. And they, they enter it with the point of just, they want to sort of sling their, their comments at you so that you can either fight with them for the benefit of their Twitter feed, or you can amen them for the benefit of their Twitter feed. And it's not, it's just, it's really depressing to be honest with you. And I just appreciate that. I'm hoping that there are still people in the audience who really want what we're trying to provide, which is a real conversation. My program is seen internationally. Mm -hmm. And I have at least as many viewers and listeners elsewhere in the world than I do in the United States. I'm an American. I'm a New Yorker. I live in New York. The company, Adagio, that hosts this is in Berlin. Mm -hmm. But it genuinely is an international program. And therefore, when I speak to the audience and to my guests, many of whom are not Americans, mm -hmm. I use an English, a, a kind of English that is as international and Mm -hmm. without weight on certain words or implications in certain words that I can do. And I made a list of words mm -hmm. just now that I think in our current context in the United States, they seem like normal words, but they mm -hmm. can be very weighted. You've already mentioned a couple of them. Uh, the first word that I wrote was American. What mm -hmm. and who is an American? And what does it mean to be American? The word that you mentioned is truth. What is truth? Fact is another. Happiness, Americans discuss all the time the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll name two more and then I'll stop and I'll give you more later. Security and family. What mm. family means, what security means. And my question for you is, can we, if we don't have a consensus on the meaning of a word or phrase, can we have a national discussion or a journalist doing an interview if we don't accept the meanings of words? Well, I, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, it reminds me of, of conversations that we were having maybe, you know, five or 10 years ago when there was a, sort of a previous kind of spasm of racial conflict such as we are having now and I remember I would you know you know sometimes you're in in my field you're invited to kind of moderate discussions or mediate you know town halls or panels and I remember so many times that people would say we can't have this conversation until we talk about x right very often it would be like white supremacy or something like that we can't talk about this until we talk about white supremacy or we can't talk about this until we talk about X. And my answer to that is we're going to. <laughs> you, you might think that, but we're going to. So I guess my response to that is the same is we're going to. So we have to muddle through as best we can. I think that it does help if we could try to define our terms, but you see that we're not going to. I mean, just for example, for those of our, our listeners who are in the United States may know this and other overseas, you may have caught wind of this. There was this big contretemps about this, something that the New York Times, which is of course a very prominent media organization in the United States, the New York Times last year published something called the 1619 Project. And it was a meditation on the way that the enslavement of people of African descent has shaped the culture, starting with the arrival of the first people of African descent in 1619 in, in a in group in a group on, on on the white lion right and of course there it, it emerges from history that there were there was an African presence on this continent prior to that but the first sort of group came there were 19 20 people came on a ship called the white lion in 1619 and it was a meditation it was just a, a series of essays meditating on what that means and what the influence of the African-American, of the African presence in America, the enslavement of people of African descent has meant to the culture and politics of this country. 
So, you know, this had no force of law. It was a series of essays by scholars and journalists reflecting on this topic. Well, oh my goodness, you know, the, the uproar, the gnashing of teeth, the clutching of pearls. I mean, you know, how dare you revisit the history as it's understood by us? You know, how dare you? And even to the point of the former president gathering a commission of people, none of them historians, to kind of develop his counter narrative of patriotic education in response to that. Um, and this group just issued their report right before the former president finally left office. And um, that was more sort of important in that because it was a governmental commission, it you know, could have had great sway over the way you know, these subjects were taught in the United States. And uh, which is widely varying, oddly enough. I think, I think that's a surprise to many people who come from overseas where the federal government, a central government has much more to say about education in the United States, it's much more decentralized. So the point here is, is that we don't agree on foundational facts of the founding of this country. So, mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's not because there's a want of information, it's because there's a desire to interpret it in certain ways for certain reasons. And I say that to say that we can't force people to think anything. That's important. It's important. We can only persuade. But I am mindful in this field that the facts are not all that matters. And, you know, you can provide people with the same facts all day long and they will choose to do with it what they will. But you've got to, I, I mean, I think that's one of those 18th century enlightenment conceits that if you, we all had the same facts, we would come to the same conclusions. That is clearly not the case, but we have to be mindful that there are facts and try to establish them and also be aware of new information when new information emerges. I guess what I'm saying to you, Fred, is that, is that you know, we can't, we can't take ownership of what people do with our work. And the same is true for you. You can't take ownership of how people will receive what you're offering to them, but you can only offer it with integrity and offer it in good faith and express your intention and, you know, and hope that there are enough people who are similarly willing to deliver it and receive it, that it will have its intended, you know, effect, because that's all you can do. I mean, you see that, that it's, we really, it's, I, I honestly think we live in a very scary time because you see all over the world, there has been an, a misinformation, kind of disinformation machinery being developed for the purpose of distorting our view of reality. And, you know, we have not figured out how to deal with that appropriately. We have not. Would you, for our American listeners, but especially international mm -hmm. listeners, mm -hmm. you just named two words that were also on my list misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. Would you explain the differences if there sure, are? Sure, of course. Well, I think misinformation is your, you know, your, your, your cousin Harriet, you know, sees something on Facebook that's wrong. And your cousin Harriet doesn't know that it's wrong, but passes it around to all the relatives because, you know, she thinks that's, it's true. Um, you know, that, masks give you cancer, you know, or something like that. You know, I mean, cousin Harriet means well, but she's wrong. Disinformation is intentional. It's intentional lying, generally for a purpose, generally for the purpose of creating either chaos or for the purpose of steering people in wrong directions. I think people in the United States will be aware of some of the really disturbing tactics that have been directed at communities of color, for example, to steer them away from voting or to intimidate them from voting, you know? Like I even seen these in my own neighborhood at election time, you know, posters telling people the wrong election day. I mean, that's just, and as we know that certain governments have perfected disinformation for the purpose of destabilizing other countries and also for the purpose of harming the reputations of persons who oppose their regimes. So these are both practices which are amplified, as we know, by technology. 
You know, it's one thing too. I mean, I, I think I am mindful, like you know, my, my colleague, you mentioned my colleague, Walter Isaacson, who was a, a colleague on Amanpour, the Amanpour uh, program, you know, very distinguished writer, author, historian, journalist, uh, former head of CNN, for example. I mean, um, written many really impactful biographies. This conversation a couple of weeks ago, I don't remember why, maybe he was giving me therapy about people being so, you know, making stuff up. And he pointed out that, you know, at the, uh, at the founding of the, the, at the founding of the United States, that the, you know, there were 11 newspapers in Philadelphia, for example, all of which had a part, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> pardon me, mm -hmm. had a partisan spin, you know, they all were attached to interest groups. And his, he told me that, you know, the, the, he told me that the, the concept of objectivity only really arose when the market couldn't sustain all these different outlets and they had to aggregate audiences in order to survive. So their technique for aggregating audiences was to kind of be more fair, you know? Um, and then of course, at the, the professionalization of all these fields, in the 20th century, you know, you know, medicine and law and, you know, the sort of the credentializing of these professions, journalists started to adapt a code of conduct for themselves. Journalism is still not a profession in the United States. There's no licensing board. You don't take a test. You, there's no certificate that you get to prove that you have passed a sort of a series of, of checks to assure certain standards. And as we know, that's an, even an imperfect process is itself, as we know, and can be flawed and can be deeply biased and can be influenced by all the other biases. But nevertheless, we don't have that. So that has its pluses and its minuses. I mean, journalists in the United States are very resistant to the idea that the government is going to decide whether and how you practice. So those checks have been largely internal to the field. But on top of that, social media amplifies it. You know, the whole concept of like the citizen journalist, like what is that? You know, on the one hand, yes, some of the most important developments in the most recent years, like George, the, the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the police officer who has been charged in his death is going on trial as we speak, or the death of Eric Garner in New York a, a number of years ago in, in police custody, who was choked to death and indicated he could breathe. All of these were citizens, bystanders who saw that occurring and posted that information going back, you know, 20 years to 30 years now, I think to Rodney King, that was a bystander. Those people weren't journalists per se, in the sense that they had undergone some training in order to give this information to the public. They posted it just out of concern. Um, and Ted Koppel used to say, you know, pointing a camera at something isn't journalism, which is true. But these were individuals who made information available to the public that had an important effect. But then what, how we interpret it, that's up to us. And how we discuss it with the public, that's up to us. Well, now it's, you know, all bets are off, as we know, right? Anybody could point a camera at anything. Like I'm sitting here, I have two cameras sitting here. And, you know, anybody can point a camera at anything. And I can make that information available all over the world within a matter of seconds. And as we see that has its positive benefits in the sense that people who are under attack, people who are being oppressed by oppressive regimes have an opportunity in many cases to be heard and to not be disappeared. On the other hand, as we know, the technology allows people to amplify falsehoods for their own agenda and our treatment, our willingness and our ability to address this hasn't caught up. I mean, it hasn't caught up. It's almost like a full-time job in a way to sort of catch up. And we're now engaged in camp various sort of campaigns as of, of, of what we call news literacy. Like we're encouraging people to practice what we call good information hygiene, you know, mm -hmm. but that's a very, you know, we're really we're starting from behind. I mean, there's that old saying that a lie is halfway around the world before the truth opens the door. I mean, have you heard this? Well, that's even more true now. And we both as people in our field and as citizens, we've got to get our hands around this. We, we, we just have to, and it's tiring. And I understand how people feel. They're like, I still, oh, I still want to be bothered. You know, I just want to like, 
know what's going on. I just want to open my Facebook feed and know what's going on. Well, unfortunately you can't because it's just, it's, it's it, you just can't. I remember a really disturbing conversation I had years ago with the, I, I was, I was visiting um, a friend whose uh, parents were born. Uh, I was in Florida and he asked me to stop by and see his parents because they were in Florida. They had retired there. They were born overseas. And I just stopped by and I called them to say, hey, I'm stopping by. Can I get anything for you? Can I do anything for you? And he said, the dad said, oh, you can bring me a paper. And I said, which one do you want? And he said, doesn't matter. They all lie. <laughs> and I was so sad because at the time I was working in newspapers, as you recall, I, you know, I had a long career in newspapers before I moved into broadcasting. And I was so sad because I wanted to argue with him and say, oh, no, that's not true. There's the, you know, this. But I, at the time, I chalked it up to the fact that he'd been born overseas and lived in a place where conspiracy theories were rife. You really couldn't trust what the papers were saying. You just couldn't. You had to kind of glean. You, you had to kind of sort through and think what you thought might be true. And, um, and I always, at the time, arrogantly thought that it was different and the United States. But unfortunately, given the environment we're now in, unfortunately, we all have to, I mean, obviously I still have great confidence in certain news organizations because I know that they act with good faith, but they aren't always right. And, and the information that people are receiving through all their various channels, like I say, misinformation from Cousin Harriet, sometimes intentional disinformation from malign actors, we, we just have to be more vigilant. And I understand how tiring that is, but unfortunately there is no choice. Regular listeners to this program know that I have more than one career. I've worked in opera mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. since 1972, mm -hmm. but I have also been in journalism. My first professional journalism job, mm -hmm. I was 19. I was a stringer for Newsweek in Milan mm -hmm. while I was working and going to school. And so I pursued the two tracks and I also do culinary stuff on the, mm -hmm. not on the side. I do that too, mm -hmm. but I've come to be aware the degree to which people can't distinguish among media. Mm -hmm. And I teach a class in many music conservatories and universities called media, social media, mm -hmm. and either the musician, the performing artist, the opera singer. Mm -hmm teaching these young musicians and artists how to negotiate the minefield of media and social mm -hmm. media, both as presences, but also in terms of understanding what to say and what not to say and how these institutions affect them. I find that most of these young people don't distinguish among media mm -hmm. so that you and I on a screen on a computer are the same as television or Mm -hmm. radio or print in some form or another. Although when I ask them to name different forms of media, none of them ever say books, which surprises me. Mm, it disappoints me, but they never mm -hmm. say books. Mm -hmm. They may say magazines and newspapers, but not books. Do they read books? I don't think they read books too much. I think they mm -hmm. read things online or on tablets. Mm -hmm. But, and these are very educated people. They read sure. their musical scores. Mm. Um, I think a key thing that is central to this program and my admiration for you is the art of listening. And we who work in music and grow up in music have to listen. Mm. And I, when I teach journalism, make people listen to music. Mm, what Even a great if they're idea. not musicians, as a means of programming their brains for the abstract, for the unfamiliar. If I play a piece of music that they may not know, they have to react and they have to take it into some degree. I don't ask them to sing back the music I've played, but I believe that the art of listening is central to our getting back to some of the fundamentals that you advocate for and I fully agree with you about. Do you think that when we use the word the media and mm -hmm. i hear people all across the political mm -hmm. spectrum complain about the media i ask them to tell me what the media are and to name them and typically it's as you said the opposing political view to what these people hold mm -hmm. 
how do we, can we educate the public on media literacy? Well, I feel that we, I don't think we have a choice, Fred. I don't think there's a choice. I think that that unfortunately has to become part of our, our work. Can I, can I ask you a question? Of course. I, I want to hear more about the, honored. The, the music. The, I want to hear more about your strategy for, you, for using music to teach active listening. How do you do, how is that? Is that mainly with musicians or is it journalism no, students? Broad? I, how I do, you, do, how do you introduce that? Tell me about that. Um, I stumbled on it a few years ago. I, for many years, have been a teacher lecturer at the Smithsonian in Washington. And before the pandemic, traveled nine times a year, 10 times a year to Washington. And now I'm still teaching online mm -hmm. lecturing. And, and I tend to go into different topics. But many, many years ago, uh, I my book, Opera 101, is the standard text in America mm. for opera education. I also wrote Classical Music 101, which came out in 2001. Mm. And when that book came out, the Smithsonian asked me to come to a talk. And I said, let's do a talk on the art of listening. Mm. And I played all kinds of sounds, many of which came from the Smithsonian archives. Mm. One of them was medical, the sound of digestion. Oh, my. And which is, you can go online and find it in the Smithsonian archives. They, they did medical sounds about 90 years ago. And this rather strange sound, everybody interpreted in different ways. What it actually was, was the stomach digesting food. And it's, I use that as an example of how we perceive the same thing differently. Yes. Wow. But nonetheless, we bring our imagination and we bring our experience. And I think it's important that we understand imagination and experience as being a team, but they're not the same thing. I could add to that knowledge as well, that I, I know, for example, that that was the sound of the stomach digesting. That became the stepping off point to teach Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. Mm, which wow. is the first piece of music I use in classical music 101. But I've done this in law firms. I've done this in arbitration settings. I've done this in dispute places. Uh, I've done this where people are just angry at one another. I can't step into a demonstration in Brooklyn as recently happened and say to the people, if you just listen to one another, maybe it could all work out because there are other factors at hand. But I genuinely, I, I, I coined a term a while ago called pleasure activist, which can sound naughty, but it's really not. It's about my belief that we have been given a remarkable gift of the five senses, but we don't really use them. You, in my experience, use your senses incredibly well, but most people don't. So that, you know, we can put food in our mouth. We don't savor it. We mm -hmm. don't experience it. We wolf it down. We hear all kinds of things. But we don't listen. We see, but we don't observe. Um, we touch, but we don't feel. We, all of these things are happening at once. We smell, but we don't really appreciate or, mm -hmm. or connect to that. And I genuinely believe that by activating our senses, pleasure activism, that this builds intuition. This builds hmm. the ability to react and respond and it creates memory of, if I smelled something that was pleasing or not pleasing, I know what that was. And I, when I returned to it, I would say, oh, that might be spoiled milk or so, that might be yogurt. So do you, do you follow up with the other senses when you're working with your journalism students on sound? Do you, do you activate the other senses as well? I, depending on the setting, I absolutely do. I taught a class a couple of years ago about the general and very fraught issue of food journalism. Mm. Um, recently, CNN did a program, a series called Searching for Italy, starring Stanley oh, Tucci. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think Stanley Tucci is a wonderful actor and presence and this Italian is pretty good. The photography was magnificent, but hundreds, literally hundreds of people contacted me asking were they right or wrong about this because I'm considered an expert on Italian culinary history. I've written many books. And unfortunately, I believe it was either the researchers or the editors who produced the script that 
simply got things wrong and it was very like frustrating. Uh, the fact that Milan Cathedral is not the largest in Italy, mm. just to name one, but that's not even a food one. But when he had carbonara in Rome mm -hmm. and they had eggs and guanciale, which is pork cheek, mm -hmm. um, and pecorino cheese and pasta, of course, they left out the pepper. They didn't say pepper. And it's called carbonara, carbone, coal, because, because of, of that. Because of the pepper. Yes. And they never mentioned pepper. And there have been several, I remember seeing, where they left out a key ingredient or didn't mention the key ingredient. See, I thought that, I thought, I, see, you're you're, now you're telling me something because I thought that the big fight was with over bacon versus, versus uh, how do you say it again? Guan, guanciale? guanciale and pancetta. Guanciale and pancetta. pancetta. I thought that was the big controversy. So you're telling me it's the pepper. Wow, okay. Well, not even a controversy, but if you present carbonara and you don't include pepper, that's not it's carbonara. Not carbonara. No, it's, but I mean, yes, throughout right. Italy, there's pork cheek, guanciale, guancia, and guancia. pancha is belly, so that's uh -huh. bacon, and it could be smoked, it could be unsmoked. There, there are many ways of doing that. Um, there's a wonderful expression in opera that the music of Giuseppe Verdi is like a pig, nothing goes to waste. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one i love it but he, he was a great gastronome and, and he owned yeah. a farm and and You're but sure. but the thing is we in america with our food journalism recently in the new york times was an article that bagels which are known in new york are made better in california than new york i mm -hmm. don't care really they <laughs> say that about montreal but mm -hmm. These are not the issues that we turn on. My interest when I talk about food, number one, is as culture and history. Just yes. the 1619 Project and the whole question of the foods that came from the African continent to the United States. I don't know if you know a, a scholar named Jessica Harris. Jessica has specialized, she's a good friend of mine, has specialized in the food of the Middle Passage and how yes, it came yes, from the Caribbean yes. and New Orleans. And uh -huh. she's a New Yorker, but a professor at the University uh -huh. of New Orleans. And Jessica and I and a few colleagues live in this world of food culture and history. Uh -huh. uh, there's something called the Columbian Exchange, which is fraught now because of feelings about Christopher Columbus. But I yeah. believe that Columbus is the most influential person in food history. He didn't set out to be. Oh, that's because fascinating. Tell me some more. Tell me of more about all that. the ingredients that came from what we call the new world, the Americas, mm -hmm. that were brought to the old world. So corn, potatoes, tomatoes, chocolate, vanilla. There are quite a few more peppers. Sure. Mm -hmm. Imagine Ireland or Germany or France or Belgium without the potato mm. or polenta without corn in Italy before it was made of millet. And chocolate arrived in Spain, the Spanish didn't know what to do with it because the Mexicans didn't tell them. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth um, mm -hmm. basically supported Mexico against Spain and imported vanilla to England. So vanilla became a popular ingredient in England before it became an adjective for plain. Mm -hmm. Vanilla is very complex. Um, and similarly, in the other direction, wheat, wine grapes, olives, bananas, rice, many products came from the so-called old world, by which I mean not just Europe, but Africa, to the new world. So bananas came from the Canary Islands, for example. Mm -hmm. um, rice was in Africa, but also in Northern Italy, different strains of rice. Wheat, imagine the United States without wheat, we wouldn't be eating bread and pasta and certain things. There are all these ingredients, beef, cattle, uh, pork, pigs came to the new world from the old world and Columbus did all that or he started all that on his four voyages. That's fascinating. Do you think that one of the other issues that you've you've surfaced for me is that this is a hard thing to say is that it's just it, it, we are in this moment where everything seems binary you know um you know that certain juris jurisdictions are undergoing what is sometimes a very painful process of determining what kinds of names shall remain on public buildings and what monuments shall remain in public spaces. 
And, you know, I think there are certain things that we can all agree on. I think like most people, although clearly not even that, but let's just say for the sake of argument that many people would argue that, say, the, the founder of the Ku Klux Klan doesn't need to be on a, on a, on a high school that children go to, right? Or that people who glorified the breakup of the union, the Confederacy, that those people of African descent or people from other backgrounds who were enslaved by these folks should not have to be paying homage to these individuals, right? Like at a school, you shouldn't have to salute the statue of the, your, the former enslaver in order to, you know, okay. But there are other folks like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington who have a very important place in the history of the United States. And then this, this question is, what do we do about that? Other folks, so I mean, obviously Abraham Lincoln did not own, own slaves, but there are, there are those who obviously believe he didn't work aggressively enough to end the institution of slavery. You know, there's this monument in Washington, DC, the, the, the Freedmen's Memorial, I don't know if you've mm -hmm. heard of it. And the, the, it's, a, it's a Abraham Lincoln standing down, um, it was paid for by formerly enslaved Americans, but there's a there's a kneeling there's an image of a of a of an African man, a man of African descent, with his chains being broken, and he's kneeling, and Abraham Lincoln is like pointing down and like kind of touching him on the head. Well, now there's an uproar about it because people are they find that the posture demeaning, which you know I think credibly you could argue it is. On the other hand, this monument was paid for by the formerly enslaved. It's a, it was a tremendous uh, act of civic engagement and sacrifice at a time when people did not have extra resources. So the fact that they devoted their resources to this, even though they were demeaned, they were not allowed to pick the design, they were not allowed to determine the placement. It was just, and Frederick Douglass gave this incredible speech where he de denounced these folks to their face you know, at the time of the memorial. And so I guess what I'm saying to you is the totality of the picture is one that it seems like we have a difficult time embracing. And you're telling me something really profound because obviously in first there was the adoration of, you know, Christopher Columbus, he, you know, the discovering a place that already had people on it. But then, you know, now that then this awakening to the, the role he played in a genocide and the way he demeaned you know, indigenous people. I mean, even transporting them as basically exhibits back to Europe. But you're adding another layer here, the way that he participated in the culture as we understand it today, that would not, our food culture would not be what it is without him. And it's just really, you're really giving me a lot to chew on here, pun intended. Um, <laughs> just in terms of, you know, how do we think about these complex figures? You know, it's just, well, you, you know what I, I mean? How do we I think do about indeed. that? I'm not Italian by heritage or whatever, but I'm fascinated by Italian culture. I know you're from New York and I want to uh -huh. get to that a little bit later, but yeah. in New York City, the very prominent spot, we have what's called Columbus Circle. Yeah. I live on Columbus Avenue by, oh. by circumstance. And Columbus Circle is part of three public spaces on the Upper West Side. Uh, Columbus Circle on 59th Street, Dante Park in front of Lincoln Center, and Verdi Square on 73rd Street in Broadway, mm -hmm. that were erected at the end of the 19th century by Italians, Italian Americans, mm -hmm. who felt that Italian Americans were badly understood. It was not even yeah. then about mafia. Right. Was about, that was a time after the Civil War, after, and we're using just terms sure, we kind of, of understand agree. Yeah the emancipation and reconstruction there was a time when some few black citizens had more freedom and mobility and that was at a time when italians who didn't speak english especially in louisiana but other states as well mm -hmm. were practically enslaved sure doing the jobs that african americans pe persons of african descent had done before so to try to rectify that image and explain that Italians were also Michelangelo and, and sure. everybody that we think of for Italy, they built in New York these three squares, Columbus, Dante, and Verdi, as great Italians. And at mm -hmm. that time, Columbus was perceived as a great Italian. Antonin mm -hmm. Dvorak, 
lived in New York in the 1890s on the 400th anniversary in 1892, there was a huge celebration in Union Square. Mm -hmm. And it was as a result of Dvorak seeing Finnish people and African people and Latino and Chinese and everything together. Union Square on 14th Street, mm -hmm. that he was inspired to write what we call the Symphony from the New World, Symphony oh. Number 9, mm -hmm. wow. about America. Mm -hmm. And he had a student, a wonderful student named Harry Burley, who was Black, who was his star pupil. And the Largo, the famous second movement of the Dvorak Symphony, is the spiritual coming home. Mm -hmm. that Harry T. Burley introduced to Dvorak. And Dvorak very consciously incorporated that music to say that persons of African descent were part of the American story. That's a beautiful story. And that was story. a symphony. Yeah. It's not of the new world. It's uh -huh. symphony from the new world. From the new world. And so symphony from the new world. It was written in effect as a report to the old world. And it premiered not in Europe, the way most famous symphonies did, but at Carnegie Hall in New York City, mm -hmm. conducted by Dvorak with the New York Philharmonic. And so these stories that we tell are stories of history that change based on perception. So that Columbus now is seen the way you described him in part as being someone who transported bodies is to Spain to deliver to Ferdinand and Isabella. And I don't think that he consciously intended to change how we eat and how no, of course not. we conduct but agriculture. Is, but it's not just, but it's not just his perception, diaries, said, though. It's agency. It's political agency. Part of it is about people expressing their agency to be seen and described in the way that they want to be. I guess that's what I'm saying is, is so I'm sure he didn't, you know, I don't know. I, I just think that this is the one of the one of the dilemmas of our age. I mean, we talked about one of the dilemmas of our age of being misinformation and disinformation, but one of the other and sort of a lack of news literacy, and in fact, I would argue a lack of civic literacy as well. But one of the other dilemmas of our age is reconciling competing narratives that are equally that are all true. Right? It is true that Columbus brought the worlds together. And it's true that he caused great harm in the course of doing that. That's all true. So then the question is, how do we live with that? And how do we talk about that? I think that is one of our central dilemmas, you know? I think the statues have to remain up, but they have to have, I don't mean of KKK, mm -hmm. but I mean Columbus, yes. Yeah. And it be explained why that statue was put up in the 1890s and right. what it meant to be an Italian then and why this is offensive now to so many people. Sure. I, I want to answer one thing you asked me about certain kinds of monuments. In Virginia, I don't recall the town, maybe it's Frederick or Fredericksburg, Virginia, but there was a place where a stump had existed. Sure, I know exactly what you're saying. The enslaved uh -huh. were sold. Right. And there was a discussion about leave it or remove it because mm -hmm. it's profoundly offensive, but it, to me, it's also profoundly instructive. And I would want people to see how horrific that was. And if we remove it and there is just a plaque, the horror of what the way people were treated is removed, it's sanitized. That's kind interesting because like I think they decided in that particular case, they decided to remove it because I think that people who live there were divided over it. And some of the people, what, what emerged as persuasive to some people is that or at least maybe they had the louder voices that they just felt that people walking over it felt offensive to them. It's almost as if you're walking over something that is, it's almost like you're walking over a grave site. Okay. Yeah. But I know in other places, like there's a place that we sometimes have visited in the summer in um, Chestertown, Maryland, where there's a, the same thing exists and it's right in the courthouse square, which I find really incredible that, you know, it's, right, that, that enslaved people were sold, bought and sold right in front of what we consider to be a temple of justice for others was a place of enslavement and degradation for, for other people. And it's right there in the middle of, in, right in the courthouse square is where the slave auctions were held. And in that community, they've made a very different decision. They've, they've actually done a really interesting job like of 
pointing out, first of all, how many enslaved people were held in that in that community. And they have like a walking tour where you can walk around and see, you know, in some of the historic houses, like where they lived. And it was, it's really quite fascinating. The other thing that's really fascinating is that the historical society, because it's on a port, there was a slave pen, like right in one of their most historic buildings. And you can, it's just, it's really quite interesting. And they have a walking tour to tell you like where people were and how many people escaped from there and it's how many enslaved people walked away from there. So they've taken a very different approach to it. And I think that's, what's interesting to me. It, it really does, you know, I, I was at a, um, at a, there was a, there was a, I, I was listening to a, a lecture the other day about um, COVID-19 as we are all around the world still living with the repercussions of it, even though we're living with it in different ways. And one of the points that this lecturer made is that people all grieve in different ways. There is no one way to grieve. And I think that the truth that is probably going to be the truth of our history as well is there's not going to be one way to live with that history, the complexity of it. And I think that it would be, you know, it would be nice if we could get to a place where we didn't feel we had to be so judgmental about the way people grapple with that history. But at the moment we do, we, we do seem to feel that it's very dire and we must judge, you know, your relationship to it. So when Fred, I, I need you to, I'm, I, unfortunately they've scheduled an interview for me at one o'clock, which I didn't know about. I'm, they're pinging my yeah. phone and I wonder like, why are you calling me? And I was like, it's, so I, I'm sorry, but I'm, at one o'clock, we're going to have to suspend because apparently so the person- So I will ask you to to, one last question okay. that I think will help understand things. Okay. I think I'm a few years older than you are and we both lived as children in Brooklyn. Where mm -hmm. in Brooklyn did you live? I lived in East New York, which is Grant Avenue on the A train, if you are aware of where mm -hmm. that is. And um, we, I was born, when I was born, my parents lived in Bed-Stuy, but I don't have Bedford-Stuyvesant for those who, are, but I have no memory of it. My active memories are from being in East New York, which is um, Grant Avenue on the A train. Mm -hmm. I asked because I, mm -hmm. the born in Manhattan and lived there from age 10 mm -hmm. on, my first 10 years were in Brooklyn in what we call Crown Heights mm -hmm, sure. at a time when it was fantastically racially and culturally integrated. And I grew up with children of all backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I know that a great part of my formation and worldview was that I was in the homes of black families and Italian families and Irish families and Asian families and Latino families and experiencing their homes and their warmth and seeing yes. mm -hmm. how we're all the same really fundamentally and we may have cultural and religious and other differences, mm -hmm. but it made me, if I had to define myself one word, it's egalitarian. Mm -hmm. And my worldview has always been egalitarian that I believe we all are entitled to the same thing and, and whether it's medical care, education or housing and all of that. And that said, and I, I would go on, but I'm respectful of your time. Mm -hmm. um, you use the phrase, before I let you go. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with that phrase? And before I let you go, I do want to thank you for everything. <laughs> oh, thank you. I've so loved our conversation. <laughs> I, 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 I love your memory of, uh, of New York because I, I have similar memories. I mean, I, I grew up in Brooklyn at a time when, you know, things were starting to get rougher I'll just put it that way and or you know how kids you don't really know what your circumstances are I remember I remember years later when I was covering politics for the Wall Street Journal before I went to I mean I was at the Washington Post then I went to the Wall Street Journal then I went to ABC and then I went to NPR but I remember when I was at the Wall Street Journal I was looking at the census track because I was covering like the 88 it was either 84 or 88 I don't remember which but I was assigned to cover the Jackson campaign for part of that and I was looking for a census tract to report from and, uh, you know, to just to discuss like how people felt about the Jackson campaign. And I said, oh, I'll just go home and stay with my parents. And I looked up the census tract and they wouldn't let me base from there because they said that the income level was too low. And I was like, wait, what? You know, I hadn't like I just, you know, you're a kid. You don't know what. You know how you, you I'm sure you've known many people who say I didn't really know I was poor, you know, which mm. but um 
but I remember growing up with kids from all different backgrounds. Like they were, they were the, the, the twin, the twins, they were the Molchanovs. And again, like her, they're, they would go, we, their, they, their apartment was across the street from our elementary school and their mom was a stay-at-home mom and she would have us over for lunch and serve us like pierogi and dumplings. And then of course we had kids from Central America, Latin America, you know, all over, you know, certainly the, the Puerto Rican families, they go back and, you know, and, and forth and uh, just, you know, there are always cousins visiting. People would go on school vacations and it just, I thought that was, a, I thought that was normal until yeah. I, you know, it, it's a shock when you grow up that way. And then you meet people who have, hatred for people because they come from a certain place and you're like wait what you know you just so it's a wonderful way to grow up on the other hand it's it sort of doesn't prepare you for the shock of realizing that some people really don't like people because they don't look like them or speak the same original language or it's just it's like you you have to wrap your you know honestly I can honestly say I was an adult before I really could accept that there were people who believe that I always thought oh no that's just they're just confused you know what I mean so when I'm in I'm doubt I look that. at my but anyway you asked me a question letter. I don't know I think it's just a polite way of of you know just saying what I, I know you have things to do and thank you for sharing your time with me and that's how I feel about you thank you for everything Michelle Martin no thank you Fred Plotkin I enjoyed it See you again. See you again. I hope so. I hope so.